Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm Lara, adoptee, psychotherapist, adoption researcher and well-being advocate. And today I'm talking about the ways in which an adopted person from childhood all the way up to adulthood will deal with the fact of being adopted, the behaviours that you'll notice and the things, the patterns that they set up, that we set up in our lives. Today's video is going to be made up of um, anecdotal stories, both my own and those of clients who I've worked with over the years, and also research-based evidence, um, which I talk about quite a lot throughout my videos. So starting with childhood, um, the book called The Primal Wound by Nancy Verrier. I'd be very surprised if you in these circles had not come across this book. It's a book that personally changed my life. Um, but Verrier, an adopted mother, wrote this book um, and highlighted in her research the findings around the two kind of main ways in which um, children deal with the fact of being adopted, um, the trauma, the loss, and the anxiety around the separation. Um, she talks a lot about internalized and externalized behaviors. And I would say that this is also backed up in the research that I myself carried out in terms of the ways, the two main ways in which younger children tend to deal with it. Um, so you've got internalized behaviors, which is the kind of the child that feels very withdrawn, very compliant, almost very easygoing. And I think I mentioned previously, that was my own experience, that the model child, if you like, the child that you could take anywhere, the child that would never cause any problems, the child that would just stay in one setting, in one place for hours on end, actually, I was, I was, um, it was reported to me from my mum how much, how easy I was as a child, what a good child I was. Um, but actually, I was, I was internalizing um, some of the experiences that I had gone through at that time. Um, and then the, the other um, ways in which um, children deal with that is through externalized behaviors. Um, and that was also, as I say, found in the research that I myself carried out and, and several research studies um, led by Grotevant in the um, United States. And so what I haven't actually established, and I'd be very interested to, to know, is whether there's a link, a correlation between those who internalize and their personality trait being um, that of um, introvert. I myself am an introvert and I was very much an internalizer. And then those who are extroverts who might be more um, readily able to externalize their feelings. Um, I would not be surprised if there were, were a link there. I myself have not found that, but I'd be super interested if anyone, anybody knows of any research that kind of finds those links. But so largely um, internalizing behavior, the quiet withdrawn child, the easy child, and then externalizing behaviors which um, are much more difficult for the parent um, to handle. Um, externalizing behaviors can be obviously tantrums, throwing themselves around, throwing items around, um, very um, outwardly expressed ang anger and confusion um, versus the, the inward expression of that um, through inter internalized um, processing or attempts at processing. Um, one thing I'll say is that um, whilst the externalizing behavior is much harder for a parent to manage, internalizing behaviors are um, much harder for the person to manage. And I say that because the, the person that inter internalizes their feelings and if that's the way that they deal with that, um, they're not actually finding an effective mechanism um, to get that feeling out of themselves. Whereas the child, the person that externalizes, whilst it's harder for everyone else, is actually doing a better job of um, honoring and um, expressing that feeling. Um, so one style easier for the parent, um, not so good for, for the individual, and the other style almost better for the individual, but certainly uh, more challenging for the parent. Um, so in the study that I referenced um, in, in several of Grotevant's um, longitudinal studies, what was found to help with that was open communication around feelings. And as a therapist myself, I would certainly encourage um, any kind of work around um, expression through drawing, through creative endeavors, um, 
painting, drawing, building things. And again, don't be too alarmed if you do that and you see some of the expression that's coming out in a creative way that feels quite negative. Actually, that's the point. The point is that the, that the individual can get some of this stuff out of themselves. And in therapy generally, we know that it's better that things are on the outside than on the inside um, in terms of our mental health and well-being. And then as, as the individual grows up, and goes into sort of later on, so goes into what here in the UK, secondary school or sort of from the age of 11, 12, 13, probably onwards, early teens um, through mid-teens, then we can probably start to see some um, mood disorders developing. Also um, attempts at managing their feelings through um, external uh, behaviours, through their relationship with food, through their relationship with, with sweet foods, um, through um, attempting to get some control over themselves through what they eat, perhaps, you know, perhaps eating disorders. Um, and then later on, as they get a little older again, you know, possibly alcohol, um, drugs, those, those types of things. Um, and as we know, that alcohol and drugs tends to be an attempt at either A, distancing from pain, or B, feeling something when we have um, effectively dissociated from our feelings altogether. Um, so those are kind of some of the main obvious ways. Um, but as um, individuals come into sort of teenage and adolescence, they have more opportunity to be outside of the home. So the social world becomes very much a focal point. Um, and it can be risky behaviours, those externalised behaviours can turn into quite risky behaviours, um, getting in trouble with the law, you know, shoplifting, things like that, that seems to be quite a, um, a common one alongside the sort of risky self damage behaviours like drugs, food and alcohol. But also, and um, again, the relationship with others um, is often a way in which some of these feelings are played out. Um, so once the individual gets to an age where they can have an adult relationship with another person, then we start to very often see some of these patterns emerging within that. And um, I myself um, have worked with, um, through early adulthood into later adulthood, um, adoptees who f fall into, again, largely one of two patterns. The first being that of really struggling to maintain um, a long-term relationship. The relationship very often becomes a substitute for, for self-worth. Um, that um, This happens, again, outside of adopt, adoption circles, but very often people are searching partners who can just make them feel good about themselves because they don't know how to feel good about themselves, number one. Um, so... So the self-concept is, is extremely damaged by being relinquished for whatever reason. I'll come back to that in a moment. But so very often the, the other person or external sources become the way in which an individual can feel worthy. And that can be very, very toxic and can end up with either mul multiple failed relationships because... Um, there's that need to feel worthy, but when somebody gets too close, which an adoptee is very often not used to, that can feel overwhelming and suffocating. And so we can see this sort of zigzagging within relationships and um, uh, sometimes see sort of ambivalent attachment style with that. Or the other way, which again, I have plenty of um, anecdotal stories from adoptees who I've worked with where they'll just put up with far too much in a relationship because the idea of giving up on it, the idea of the ending, the idea of being without the person um, is, is too challenging to think about. The idea about having given up, being given up, rejected, abandoned, relinquished, um, feeds right into their self-concept and their self-worth. Um, so we see those patterns playing out an awful lot in adulthood. And those might also accompany other um, damaging behaviours, um, such as self-harm, you know, food, as I said earlier, drink. Um, in fact, one really interesting study that happened in Spain um, with uh, same culture adoptees. And as I mentioned previously, I, I deliberately chose same culture, same race adoptees to study so that I could compare them like for like with the general population within the country. Um, 
that study found that adult adoptees were consuming far more um, alcohol than the average population. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we know that substances like alcohol and, and drugs and often food are an attempt to, um, I repeat, are an attempt to either uh, distance from painful emotions or to feel an emotion, albeit negative, but to feel something um, when we have um, successfully managed to detach from our emotions because they're too difficult or too complicated or we just can't understand. We have nowhere to go with the emotion that we have. Um, so yeah, those are some of the ways in which we, we see this, this play out. And just on, just on the point of relinquishment and the um, idea about having been given up by the mother, you know, the mother is such an important um, figure in the life of anybody. We know that to be true, that the mother holds a lot of power um, within our lives. And um, it's something that is very, very difficult to come to terms with. And one of the things I wanted to say is that even though logically you might say, well, she couldn't keep me. And, and again, that was my own story. There was no way that um, the time, at the time that I was born, my mother could have kept me. Whilst I, as I grew up, could understand that from a logical point of view, um, it made no difference to the pain. And so it's really important to understand that, you know, when you're having conversations, you can have those kind of conversations around where you, you know, this was the circumstance and, and so it was absolutely vital that you were adopted. You've got to have the conversations around the pain. Um, that's one really important part for helping some of these negative patterns to, to play out less, for challenging the internal narrative that, adoptee, that an adoptee has about themselves, that they're not worthy, that they're not good enough. Um, and so if you can start those conversations um, as soon as possible, it's really, really important to, to do that and to listen with an open heart and with compassion. No matter how challenging your adopted child is, is being, you know, they're behaving from a place of pain, confusion and loss. So I hope today's um, video has been helpful. I am happy to link in below the reference for Nancy Verrier's book and anything else that you would like to see references for where I mention research. Um, but Nancy Verrier's book, I would absolutely recommend if you haven't read it, and you're an adoptive parent and or an adoptee. As I said, for me, it changed my life as an adoptee um, when I discovered it. And um, I would absolutely, it's recommended reading and it's called The Primal, Ro the Primal Wound by Nancy Verrier. And um, I'll link it below. It's kind of a, a couple decades old now, the book, but it's very, very insightful and pretty helpful. And so that brings me to the end of today's video. As always, I hope you have found it helpful and insightful and that you can just keep talking, try and open up conversation as, as frequently as you can. Be patient and be loving. And um, if you like these videos, please like, subscribe, comment and tell everyone. And if you want to know about the new videos coming out, hit the bell and you will get notified of those as soon as they do. There's lots more like this coming, coming your way. It's very important to me and um, I hope that we can do this all together. Thank you.